very much. I, I'd like to start by passing out copies of, of the Article 14 of our Constitution, uh, actual copies of the petitions that I were circulated. It. I have it. You have that already? No, you have The petitions that were circulated uh, last year. Thank you. Uh, Uh, I guess actually starting the year before last. Thank you. Gathered a few hundred thousand of them uh, and uh, measure before the voters. And by we, I mean uh, a group called New Approach Missouri. I have the honor of being president of that group throughout the time that we were drafting and uh, working hard to get this on the ballot. I tell you, it is not easy to put a measure on the ballot in Missouri. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. We decided to place it on the ballot as a constitutional amendment as opposed to a statutory initiative. There are important differences. It takes about twice as many signatures to put a constitutional amendment on the ballot, so it's hard, especially hard to do that. But the important difference is if you pass a statutory initiative, a, a state law initiative that does not amend the state's constitution, well, the legislature can turn right around and just undo it. And they will. They've demonstrated that time after time. They have no respect for the will of the voters. Same darn voters that put them in office, they'll turn right around and undo what those voters did. Um, I say those voters knew what they were doing when they elected me, but they were way off base when they passed this crazy <laughs> whatever it might be. Uh, so if you want it to stick, it's got to be a constitutional amendment. Now, I suggest we should amend our state's constitution to protect statutory initiatives from arbitrary and capricious action by the legislature and, and if that were done we'd see fewer things like bingo and medical marijuana in our state constitution and that is an ongoing debate and I, I, I want you to be aware of that because that that issue is continuing to be debated it's being debated right now in Jefferson City um, there's some I think very bad ideas about how to fix that, that perceived problem. Um, I, I really appreciate the chance to talk to you. I want to apologize for not being here the last time I was scheduled. Rose tells me you had a long schedule anyway, and you're probably glad not to see me that night. And uh, I don't want to wear out my welcome this evening either. Uh, but she has in, in, invited me on your behalf to speak about several topics, so I'll try to touch on them all and, and maybe uh, if you wish at some future date go into more depth on, on some of them. Um, but I, uh, I really do appreciate your service on this commission. Um, it's uh, I think sometimes a thankless job to be on a citizen board or commission. But I served on a half dozen of them uh, many years ago including uh, a stint as the first chair of the Columbia Human Rights Commission. And, uh, and that was that was a very valuable experience uh, for me in, in many ways, and I learned a lot about how our community works, and I'm sure uh, you all uh, have as well. Um, Rose invited me also to talk about the topic of, of First Amendment activities and civil liberties generally. Um, the ACLU is certainly the nation's best known and most effective and active uh, advocate for civil liberties. Uh, the distinction between civil liberties and civil rights is sometimes kind of fuzzy, but civil rights we usually think of as the right to vote, the right against uh, discrimination in housing and public, um, uh, rather in, uh, public accommodations and employment. Um, uh, civil liberties are, are the broader concept of the basic values that we all think are part of a civilized society. So the First <coughs> Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth and Sixth Amendments to varying degrees uh, are all what are considered civil liberties issues. The ACLU had a chapter here in mid-Missouri for about 42 years, and I was part of that group for most of that time. Um, but a few years back, and uh, probably seven or eight years back, the ACLU began to reorganize itself uh, nationally uh, and in the states and, um, and to a large uh, degree has done away with local chapters. So there's still a very active ACLU in Missouri and it's based in St. Louis and it covers the entire state, but there are no longer local ACLU chapters. Well, here in mid-Missouri, our chapter was determined that, that we would not, we would not go away, we would not fade quietly uh, away, and so we uh, simply reorganized under a new moniker, and we're now called the Mid-Missouri Civil Liberties Association. MOCLA is our acronym, and uh, MOCLA uh, continues to function and, and advocate for civil liberties here in our community, and I want you all to be aware of that in particular. I, I don't think we've done a great job of, of making our name and our presence known. Uh, we haven't sued a whole lot of people. We'd probably get more attention if we sued more. But uh, uh, we have uh, engaged in activities similar to what 
uh, some of the things that you all do, and that is engaging in public education activities uh, and uh, candidate forums focusing on civil rights and civil liberties issues uh, and other activities. So um, um, we, we continue to fill that role that the ACLU chapter here in mid-Missouri filled for many years. Now the ACLU here, uh, and we still work closely with the ACLU, in fact, uh, the staff uh, and uh, uh, board in St. Louis, um, the ACLU litigated several civil rights and specifically First Amendment cases here in mid-Missouri uh, during the past 50 years. It seems, uh, I mean, this is my 50th year in Columbia, and, and maybe that's why I just am more sensitive to it, but it seems like there's a lot of 50th anniversaries coming around lately, and, and one of them is the 50th anniversary of a case that went to the United States Supreme Court and originated on the MU campus on February the 16th of 1969, actually before I even came to Columbia. A graduate student in journalism named Barbara Papish was distributing a publication called the Columbia Underground Free Press, and I wish I had copies. I, I, I should have copies, but I'll be glad to get your copy if you wish. Um, uh, that publication, which was uh, uh, closely allied with the SDS, the Students for Democratic Society, um, had been distributed for a few years. It was approved on campus to be circulated, but this particular issue, and maybe because it was Parents Week, uh, caught the attention of university administrators. It, it featured a, a, a political cartoon on the cover of the Statue of Liberty and the uh, Goddess of Justice being raped by police officers. And, um, and uh, inside featured a story headlined, Mother or Acquitted, uh, and that was indeed the name of a group, and they had a case in court, and there was some, you know, reason to have that headline in there. but. Um, her case, she was immediately arrested, and so was the future first poet laureate of our state uh, and uh, some other students, but Barbara was already on disciplinary and academic probation, and she was a target, and she was expelled. Um, the ACLU came to her aid. They litigated this case through the federal district court, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, and finally the U.S. Supreme Court. And she had lost at every other level, but the U.S. Supreme Court overruled those decisions and held that, in fact, even what might be considered indecent speech, was the term the university had used, is protected on a university campus uh, when students choose to engage in that, especially politically expressive activity. Political expression, of course, enjoys the highest degree of protection under the First Amendment, more so than artistic, more so than commercial speech. Political speech is the, uh, is the area in which the First Amendment is most important. At least that's what the courts have held. There was a, another case that came around, and I was here uh, for the genesis of the, of the Gay Lib case. Gay Liberation was a group that formed at the University of Missouri in the early 70s, very early 70s, and uh, operated informally at first off campus, and, and then temporarily we kind of were able to get them uh, use of university facilities. But when the group called Gay Liberation, which wanted to work for uh, gay people's rights uh, applied for university recognition as a student organization, um, the university balked. Uh, that process in those days, and I think still begins by going to the student senate, the MSA senate uh, reviews and then makes a recommendation to, uh, to the university as to whether to recognize uh, uh, an applicant to become university recognized as a student organization. There are about 400, I think, last time I uh, saw a figure. and. Um, uh, although the MSA Senate, far from unanimously, but by a solid majority, recommended uh, that this group be recognized, which essentially bestows the right to use university facilities, meeting rooms, and potentially to receive uh, funding as a student organization, although there's no guarantee of that. Um, the, the university administration, uh, as often seems to be the case, studied that issue for a long time, hoping we would go away, or this group would go away. And, uh, we just didn't go away. Um, and so eventually the Board of Curators ruled and said, no, or hell no, we're not going to recognize any gay students organization. I mean, gay sex is illegal after all, and this is promoting illegal activity. Uh, and uh, of course, it wasn't that at all. It was promoting changing the law. And I, I uh, am amused when the university now, uh, uh, and I'm glad they do, uh, brags about how inclusive and diverse they are and how they're proud to have gay people uh, on campus and have their uh, facilities used for uh, gay people's rights. I can tell you that 50 years ago, it was precisely the opposite. Um, ACLU once again went to bat uh, after, uh, our, after years of uh, discussion. Uh, 
through the university administrative channels and all the various levels of appeal, um, ACLU went to court to uh, seek uh, that the university be ordered to recognize the gay liberation organization. Uh, and once again, uh, they prevailed. I think they did not prevail at the district court, but the uh, Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit ruled in uh, favor of the student group. I'm not sure if that was me or somebody else, but uh, it was me. Um, and uh, indeed, the university asked the U.S. Supreme Court to further review that decision from the Eighth Circuit, which is in St. Louis, which includes several Midwestern states. Um, and the U.S. Supreme Court declined to grant cert or certiorari or further review. So in effect, uh, confirming or affirming the decision of the Eighth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, and that became a textbook case. Uh, literally, when I was uh, a law student several years later, I was thrilled to see that that case in which I had a small role uh, in the student senate uh, it was a, literally a textbook case in constitutional rights and civil liberties. We, uh, we that is the ACLU, also uh, litigated uh, when I was in law school uh, a case, a couple of cases that grew out of the Shantytown protests. Now, if you were uh, on, I think, almost any campus in the country back in the mid-80s to early 80s, uh, you probably recall that there were uh, were a great deal of protests relating to universities' investments in, country, in, in companies doing business with South Africa, and by doing so, propping up that racist apartheid regime. Well, students, uh, and I was very happy to see this when I went back to school uh, in the early 80s, having graduated almost uh, in the early 70s, um, uh, and, and that was an issue that students were very deeply concerned about. I got involved with that group, and um, they built shanties on the quadrangle between Jesse Hall and the columns, uh, and they were there for weeks and perhaps months before one day the chancellor looked out the window and said, I'm tired of seeing those shanties on the quadrangle, called up the university police, said arrest those students. Uh, and, and you know, it, it struck me at that time that university chancellors have an armed force at their disposal, you know? If, if the chancellor says go arrest whoever, by golly, they will arrest whoever. And I don't know if the mayor can do that. I don't think the mayor can call up the police chief and say, I want this person arrested, you know? I think the, the officers make their own decisions about that. But at any rate, uh, I uh, had just gotten out of class and came over to the quad and watched 42 of my friends uh, being hauled off in a school bus to what was then the uh, Boone County Jail. And it was a hovel. It was a true dungeon. It was tacked on the back of the courthouse. The courthouse has been expanded since then. But the expansion on the north side of the Boone County Courthouse was where the jail was. And it was a just a classic medieval dungeon. Uh, it didn't have a great capacity. The university forgot to ask the Boone County Jail if they had 42 vacancies. And they didn't have 42 <laughs> vacancies. And so I go over there. Uh, and, and didn't necessarily uh, assert that, I mean, I wasn't even a lawyer yet, but I, I was there, and, and so I remember being on the phone with one of our judges saying, well, if these guys will just sign a statement that they'll follow the rules, then uh, we'll let them go. And I say, well, Judge, uh, you know, they're not going to sign that statement. He said, all right, let them go anyway. <laughs> so they, some of them took those jail cells hostage. They did have to say they would come to court when they were ordered to come to court, like you know, most people do when they're given a summons or a ticket. And some of them wouldn't do that, and some of them were held overnight. And at that time, anyone who was held overnight in a Boone County jail, and, and it wasn't just Boone County, it was some others as well, was strip searched and body cavity searched. And um, you can imagine exactly what that means. It's, it's just what you imagine. Um, and so these, these kids were charged with misdemeanor trespassing on the quadrangle. You know, nobody in 150 years uh, had been charged with trespassing on the quadrangle. Um, it was clearly, in our view, it was clearly a, a suppression of speech. The, the university didn't like what they were saying and uh, so chose to, to tell them they were trespassing. Um, at any rate, uh, some of the students stayed in jail. Some of the students went on a hunger strike. Some of the students uh, uh, wrote letters from the jail, like Martin Luther King, um, and, and it, it was really inspiring. Well, at any rate, so uh, Gary Oxenhandler and I litigated that case. Gary, of course, knew what he was doing, and I didn't, uh, but I got to tag along, and he later became presiding uh, judge of our circuit court. And um, I remember we met with Joe Mosley, who was then county prosecutor, and it was probably Gary's idea, uh, who said to Joe, uh, uh, well, how about if, you know, I mean, because Joe said, I don't know what the law is on this. I, I don't know if you're right or not. You know, I'm, 
You know, he really didn't have any enthusiasm for that case. And we said, well, how about this? How about if you dismiss 41 out of 42 cases and we'll take this one case to court and it'll be a test case? And he said, sure. So we won 41 cases <laughs> at that moment. And Gary said, Dan, you pick out who should be our test subject. So I thought, well, this Catherine Benson is bright. She's a local girl. Her dad's on the faculty. She's very articulate and committed. I'll just ask Catherine Benson. Some of you may know Catherine's now an attorney here in town and a public defender again, actually. Um, and she immediately said, yes, I'll be the guinea pig. And so uh, uh, local judges didn't want this case, but uh, Patrick Horner from, from Callaway County was appointed to uh, hear the case. And there was really no, there wasn't a trial as such because there was no dispute over the facts. Everyone agreed what had happened and what the facts were. The question was, whose side is the law on? And um, so we briefed the issues and submitted the case on the briefs to Judge Horner. And uh, I guess he may have been a new judge at that point because no one really seemed to know what to expect from Judge Horner. Uh, but he came back with the right decision. He said, this is First Amendment activity. You can't charge this girl with trespassing for engaging in First Amendment activity. And uh, there was no appeal uh, in that case. That was a criminal case. The prosecution didn't get to appeal. So um, that, was, that was an expiring uh, experience. Well, the second case that arose out of that dealt with the strip searches. And it turned out that there was actually a statute, a, a state law that forbids strip searching and certainly body cavity searching of people charged with misdemeanors. Now, if they charge with a felony, you can do it, but not for misdemeanors unless there was a specific reason to believe that the person is holding evidence or weapons. Um, but the general rule was you can't do that to people who are charged with just a misdemeanor. And um, so it seemed pretty cut and dried, uh, but um, Boone County in that case didn't want to settle these cases. Uh, ACLU sued. Again, I was just the tag along, the second chair to Frank Sussman, a great lawyer from St. Louis. Uh, and uh, so we sued in federal court. Scott Wright was our judge. He was a former Boone County prosecuting attorney and uh, a great man. Uh, and so we, we went to trial uh, down in Jeff City. And, you know, this is the first trial I've ever been involved in. And it was just like the movies. I thought, this is, this is great. Um, so we've got, uh, I I think there may have been about 21 plaintiffs uh, in the case. They're all down there. They're all my friends and, and uh, cohorts. And, and uh, Frank is doing a great job. He's got Sheriff Ted Bame on the, on the witness stand, and, and he's questioning, cross-examining Sheriff Bame. And I remember at one point Judge Wright, who always had kind of a high-pitched uh, voice. He was a wiry World War II fighter pilot. Uh, and he says at one point, he interrupts Sheriff Bame and says, Sheriff, I've heard enough of that. I don't need to hear any more. Now, jury, I'm going to tell you that the county's wrong. You just decide how much money these people are going to get. And I thought, man, that's the way it ought to be. That's, that's justice, you know, and that's what happened. So they didn't get a whole lot of money, uh, but we got a, quite a bit of lawyer fees for the ACLU uh, out of that second Shantytown case and the real victory it's the greatest case I've been involved with yet. The real victory was that all the sheriffs in Missouri were in, uh, insured by the same insurer. They had a package deal. And that insurer wrote to every sheriff in the state of Missouri and said, if you strip search and body cavity search people in violation of this law again, you are officially not covered. Uh, you, you will be paying out of your pocket if uh, you do this again and you get sued. And so it was a pretty effective uh, incentive not to let that happen anymore. And, and, and I was just really proud to have a small role in that case. Well, the, the other First Amendment case at ACLU litigated here uh, in uh, Columbia came a few years after that, and it was the Memorial Day Air Show, the Salute to Veterans Air Show. And there was a uh, ongoing discussion of what First Amendment activity would be tolerated on the city's uh, airport tarmac during, during those events. And, and some um, peace nicks wanted to uh, distribute subversive literature out there, and, and uh, of course the Slutcher veterans didn't want any of that going on. And uh, so we, we litigated that case. Uh, uh, Bill, uh, <laughs> Bill, whose name is this, Wickersham, Bill Wickersham uh, was one of the plaintiffs in that case, and he was arrested for petitioning. That's what he was doing that was, uh, that was alleged to violate the rules, was circulating a petition for peace uh, at the air show. And uh, 
I believe there are at least one or two other plaintiffs in that case. And, and so we litigated again in federal court uh, in that case and, and won a, a partial victory. Uh, it was uh, Judge Lowry. Uh, Judge Lowry ruled in that case. And I know I was disappointed at the time. She ruled that, that you can wear clothing, hats and t-shirts with whatever message you want on them. Um, and you can say whatever you want to say out there, but she actually ruled against the petitioning. And I, I was very disappointed and I'm still disappointed in that decision. I think she was trying to split the baby and, uh, and it seems to me that petitioning is fundamentally protected, but that was the ruling and to this time, as far as I know, that, that's still the law. So MOCLA and the ACLU had some role in forming this body that you all are serving on. Uh, and 10 years ago, I guess, I, I, uh, I was just rereading some of the history and, and would not have known otherwise, but apparently you're celebrating your 10th anniversary as a, as a body here in, in the city. Um, and uh, I remember harassing Mayor Heinemann, Darwin Heinemann, about trying to get this group formed and it had been talked about and talked about and it got shoved aside. And, and uh, so always during the election was the best time to bring these things up. And, and, uh, and Darwin was a very good man, a very good uh, mayor. Um, and if I recall correctly, he was instrumental in finally getting uh, the body established. Uh, and MOCLA and the ACLU, I think both had a role, uh, were part of that alliance of citizens and groups here in town that advocated for the establishment of the CPRB. And I'll tell you that MOCLA is um, concerned and, and, and will continue to be concerned about the racial disparities in law enforcement. You all are certainly familiar with that issue. Um, it has always struck me that, you know, stopping a car in many cases, especially after dark, uh, an officer doesn't know who's driving that car uh, in most instances, I suspect. And so how can you accuse him of having a racial bias or her of having a racial bias in stopping a vehicle? But what has always struck me is that the disparity is even greater in terms of who gets searched. And by the time you get around to searching the vehicle, you know darn well who's driving it. Uh, and, and that concerns me more. I've always been more concerned about the disparities in, in who gets searched um, than, uh, than who gets stopped. And if I recall correctly, just a couple of years ago, the statistics showed uh, that something like half of the people whose vehicles get searched in Columbia are African Americans. And, and, and that strikes me as uh, something that's just not right. Um, I don't know what the solution is. Um, I don't think that there are very many, if any, police officers who are what most people would call racist on our police department. Uh, and I think most, if not all of them, struggle to do a good job and it's a very hard job to do. But I just don't think that statistic is acceptable. Uh, some of you may know Don Love. Don has studied this issue and knows it better than anyone I've met. Uh, and uh, I know there are a lot of experts from outside the community and, and there are others certainly within the community. But, but Don Love, who serves on MOCA's board of directors, um, is, is someone who I uh, would commend to you, uh, if you if you want someone who, who really does know that issue and, and really does know the statistics uh, that relate to our community. One of the areas in which racial disparities are most striking uh, is in marijuana law enforcement. And ACLU issued a national report, and it's probably been more years than I realize, it seems like five years, seven years ago, called, uh, I believe the title was Marijuana in Black and White in a subtitle, you know, an ACLU study of racial disparities in marijuana law enforcement. And, and it's, a, it's a comprehensive study because you can look up there, uh, there are 50 pages dealing with each state. You can see easily what the state racial disparity rate is in marijuana law arrests and convictions. You can break it down county by county. Um, and, and some of the figures, again, are just, are just very striking. Um, that study is somewhat out of date now, but I still commend it to you if you want to see a very comprehensive study of, of that issue, uh, it's, it's the best I've ever seen. Um, well, if I can continue, and you should cut me off when, you, when uh, Rose has told me I could go 30 to 60 minutes. I want to leave a little time for questions. But um, another issue that Rose has asked me to address is uh, the Missouri Medical Marijuana Law that passed last um, September, or last November, rather, November 6th. Remarkable that it had support from nearly. There were about a half dozen other issues on that ballot. None of them came close to that. Clean Missouri was the next nearest, around 
none of the statewide candidates, and there were many millions of dollars spent on those campaigns. What is also important, I think, is just within the county, of course, the vote was considerably stronger than it is statewide. Roughly 72% if all correctly here in Boone County that favored that law. And downtown, here in downtown Columbia, something like 80% of voters favored that proposal. Now this was on an off-year ballot. If this had been a presidential election ballot, the numbers would almost certainly have been substantially higher. And that is a rule of uh, initiative politics that it took me a long time to grasp, but it's very, very clear that if you want to pass a progressive initiative, you should put it on a presidential election ballot. Indeed, Columbia's ordinances, which decriminalized marijuana possession back in 2004, had failed on three previous attempts. But when we put it on a presidential, and, and they were, you know, it was voted on in April and August and June and, you know, other times that just weren't smart. Um, but, and, and partly it was the evolution of public attitude. But when we put it on the presidential election ballot in 2004, the, the numbers flipped. It had failed 60-40. A lot of people just assumed it would fail again, but it didn't because we were on a presidential ballot. It passed 60-40. Um, and, and those laws with slight revisions are still still on the books here. And they have been an example, which has now been followed by the city of St. Louis. The Board of Alder people there passed a, a similar uh, ordinance for the city of St. Louis a few years later. In April of 2017, a, a small committed group of people with no money um, put an initiative on the Kansas City ballot and very similar to Columbia's, except the, the fine here in Columbia goes up to $200. The Kansas City Initiative made it $25. And I thought, well, gosh, you guys are biting off more than you can chew here. There's no way you're gonna win in an April election with a small turnout and $25, my God. You know, I don't think you're gonna, gonna win that, but I wished them luck and helped them as much as I could. Well, you know, with the opposition from the Kansas City Star and opposition from some former prosecutors on the city council, um, they won, and they won big time. They won with 75% support of the voters in Kansas City, and, and that was a truly uh, amazing uh, outcome. So we were uh, encouraged uh, uh, by that and other polls that showed support for medical marijuana statewide being very high to put this question on the ballot. Um, I'll run through some of the things it says. One of the things it does, and it's a constitutional amendment, Article 14, we proposed it to be Article 16, as you'll see on the petition, but somewhere, somehow there was no 14 and 15, so they changed that. Uh, the final draft of the rules and regulations, consistent with these 13 pages of fine print, of course, will be published by the Department of Health and Senior Services by June 4. Now, they've been very open and very responsive to um, input and they've, they've published drafts of these rules and regs a half dozen times already. And uh, each time I think they get better. And I really want to compliment Dr. Randall Williams who uh, uh, was actually appointed by former Governor Greitner. Maybe the best thing he did was appointing Randall Williams to be the head of DHSS in Missouri. And he in turn hired a guy named Lyndall Fraker to run this program. And they're doing a great job. And they're pursuing it with all deliberate speed and with good faith intent to follow what Article 14 requires. By August 4th, if, if, well, by July 4th, uh, you can actually apply to be a qualified patient, and that takes a letter from a doctor that says you've been diagnosed with a condition that's included in Article 14, and I'll run through them in a minute. By August 4th, either DHSS has to approve you as a patient or you're automatically approved. Um, I think they will, in fact, uh, process all of those by, by August 4th, most likely, and that very few applicants will be denied. On August 3, the day before, is actually the day when DHSS is required to begin to accept commercial license applications. There are four of them. Cultivation, manufacturing, which means creating infused products, brownies, cookies, beverages, uh, because many patients prefer to consume cannabis orally, not by smoking. Either they don't like smoking or the land won't, won't let them smoke. And the fact is that in many states, uh, most patients uh, avoid smoking. Uh, and, and consume their cannabis in other ways that are probably healthier. Um, so uh, cultivation, manufacturing of products, testing, which is very important. Testing is required. It will allow patients to know exactly what they're getting. They'll know its purity. They'll know its potency. Um, and finally, dispensing. It is establishing a retail dispensary. Now, the P&Z Commission is going to hold a hearing tomorrow night about some of the proposals from the planning staff about what the regs should be in Columbia. And, uh, well, 
We'll hear more about that, of course. Uh, by the end of this year, you can, you can apply for those licenses August 3rd, but you will not know if you've got a license probably until the end of this year. So a point that I'm trying to make to the PNZ is there's no rush. There's no need to rush through this process. And we've got the rest of this year at least our local rules and regs, and, and they will continue to evolve. There's no doubt of that. Um, by the spring, by this time next year, uh, uh, I think realistically, hold to patients. Uh, and patients will be able to cultivate for themselves beginning uh, on the 4th of August of this year in their homes, small a number of plants uh, under uh, secured conditions, um, as most of the other 32 states do allow patients to cultivate for themselves. Yes. How many dispensaries? Under the proposed regs, they can have uh, 6 to 12 immature plants that don't have anything consumable, but just six plants. And a patient's caregiver, uh, if licensed by the DHSS, can be the person who cultivates if the patient, him or herself, is not capable of doing so. The conditions that a doctor must uh, certify uh, that qualify a patient uh, include cancer or the, sim <laughs> the symptoms or the side effects of treatment for cancer, epilepsy, glaucoma, uh, intractable migraines unresponsive to other treatments, um, a chronic medical condition that causes severe persistent pain or muscle spasms, including uh, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Tourette's syndrome. Um, that's very important, chronic pain. You know, the, the state of Colorado, we think, is way ahead of us, but they've just now added pain to the list of conditions that you can buy medical marijuana for in Colorado. Illinois only added pain fairly recently. When the National Academy of Sciences reviewed all of the existing scientific and medical literature about medical marijuana, they found in a survey published in January of 2017 that pain is the single most well-established therapeutic application for cannabis. That cannabis has been proven to be effective in the treatment of pain, and that's so important because what people are using to treat pain right now to a large degree is very dangerous drugs, opioids. And we're seeing thousands of people die because the lethal dose is not a whole lot more than the therapeutic dose. And because people uh, develop uh, dependence, they develop addiction, they develop tolerance to opioid drugs. Um, and this leads them to use more to get the same pain relief. Opioids were never appropriate for chronic pain relief. They're great for a battlefield injury, a car wreck uh, survivor. Uh, but they're not good for pain year after year or even month after month. Uh, cannabis is. Cannabis, it turns out, is an effective pain reliever and does not uh, uh, cause tolerance or addiction in any real physical sense at least uh, and, and doesn't uh, cause dependence and doesn't, most importantly, doesn't kill anybody. You know, that's why cannabis is a far better drug uh, than opioids. I heard Jeff Sessions said one time, well, that's just substituting one addiction for another. Well, you know, whether it's addictive or not, it's substituting a drug that won't kill you for one that will kill you. And, and anybody should be able to perceive that that's probably a, a, a good idea. Um, so, in fact, the study that began to cause people to realize this is uh, one published by JAMA uh, in their journal Internal Medicine in August of 2014, and they showed by simply looking at the uh, numbers of people dying from opioid overdose uh, and correlating that with which states um, have uh, medical marijuana and which don't. Uh, per capita, they found that the medical marijuana states on average had 25 percent fewer people dying from opioid overdose, and that was, that was several years back. They found, moreover, that this was probably not just a correlation, but truly cause and effect, because the reduction in the per capita rate of opioid overdose death was smallest, around 20% in states that have just legalized medical marijuana. And it's greatest, 33%, and we hope climbing, in the states that have had medical marijuana longer. Studies since then have demonstrated that the prescribing of opioids, as you might expect, is much lower in states with medical marijuana available. Most patients don't want opioid drugs if they can get pain relief from a drug that doesn't cause intense and life-threatening constipation, that doesn't threaten to kill them. Uh, most patients actually prefer that. And, and also the prescribing of many of the psychotropic drugs that are used to treat depression and anxiety uh, have likewise been demonstrated to be dramatically reduced uh, in states with access to, to legal medical marijuana. So others <laughs> include 
uh, debilitating psychiatric disorders, including PTSD, but only if diagnosed by a psychiatrist. The other conditions can be diagnosed by an MD or a DO, but uh, psychiatric disorders, PTSD in particular, you have to have a letter from a psychiatrist. Uh, and HIV and, and AIDS, of course, uh, and a chronic condition that's normally treated with prescription medications that lead to physical or psychological dependence. It's kind of really restating the earlier one about the treatment of pain, uh, but other chronic conditions that may be treated by those types of drugs um, specifically are uh, conditions for which cannabis can be uh, recommended instead if a physician believes that cannabis would be effective and is a safer alternative in a terminal illness or in the judgment of the doctor, any other chronic debilitating or medical condition, including but not limited to another list, hepatitis C, ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, IBS, Crohn's, Huntington's, autism. Autism is uh, something that's being researched and there's a growing body of evidence that the cannabis can be very helpful in treatment of that condition. Neuropathies, meaning pain that originates in the nerves, sickle cell anemia, agitation from Alzheimer's, cachexia, uh, and wasting syndrome. Um, so it is actually uh, whatever the doctor believes uh, is, is appropriate, can be a condition for which cannabis can be used. Physician is again an MD or a DO under Missouri law, not a physician from some other state. Certification means a document, handwritten, electronic, whatever format. Qualifying patient, somebody who's got a letter from a doctor saying they've got one of those conditions. Um, I note that the doctor doesn't have to actually recommend or say that I know this is helping uh, relieve this patient's condition. We've tried to make it as easy for doctors to write those qualifying letters uh, as possible. Um, so what's the qualifying letter say, just that this person has this condition? Yes. And that's it? Yes. This person has been diagnosed with this condition. But that's all the physician has to certify, yes. One of the things that I read was that um, doctor doesn't technically have to say what the condition is so that he doesn't violate well, HIPAA. That's being debated. Um, we think that's true, but, you know, we're not, we're not expecting a doctor would actually write a letter that doesn't specify the condition. The DHSS's proposed rules and regs say that, he, that the doctor does have to specify the condition, and I don't think we're going to argue about that. Now, it's possible that some things the legislature may try to do, or even some things DHSS might try to do that we think are inconsistent with Article 14, uh, we certainly could litigate. And, you know, if it's not consistent with Article 14, it is unconstitutional. Um, but I don't think we're going to argue about that when I think they will, in fact, specify the condition. Um, do they have, uh, is there any pardon. idea of what to do in case, for some reason, your marijuana prescription is withdrawn, like the physician says you don't need it anymore? If it's withdrawn, the physician says they don't need marijuana anymore. They have to be renewed annually. They have to be renewed annually. The patient has to pay a $25 fee for uh, the application, $100 if they want to be uh, a cultivator. But they do have to go back to the doctor. The doctor has to see the patient uh, hands-on, not just on the phone, not in, all over the Internet, but has to actually see the patient. Um, would they go to, if there's any plants left the patient has, do they, have to, do, they have to, do they have to go confiscate the plants? Well, one of the, again, proposed rules and regs says that those plants have to be taken to a, I can't remember, either a dispensary or a cultivation center. Uh, you know, if, if the patient follows the law, that, that's what will happen. <laughs> How do you reconcile state law with federal? Because you're dealing with large sums of money that, can't, add, can't go into a federal bank mm -hmm. due to federal law. And then it may be subject to money laundering. It can't enter the stream of commerce. So how are you going to reconcile that? And secondly, you deal with uh, civil liberties. There is a conflict when people fill out a 4473 that says, are you an illegal, a user of illegal <laughs> substances? For firearms. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. They are a legal user of yeah. marijuana, yeah. but under federal law, it's illegal. So, sure. Well, those are two very important questions, and they're both the subject of pending federal uh, legislation, and that legislation is picking up steam. Um, and, and, of course, no one knows for sure when or whether Congress is going to address those. But the safe 
Banking Act, SAFE is some kind of acronym for something. Uh, that's got a lot of steam behind it. The banks really want that money, of course. They just don't want to lose their FDIC. Uh, and so uh, I think that's going to pass pretty quickly. In the meantime, there are banks which are sticking their necks out. There are banks which are accepting deposits. Not very many, but there are some. And uh, savings and or rather, uh, uh, not savings and loans. Credit but, unions. Uh, Pardon me? Credit unions? Yes, credit exactly. Unions. Credit unions, in some cases, seem to be either braver or not subject to the same regulations, perhaps, that the federal agencies are. Um, as far as the guns go, no one's had their guns taken away. And the people who have contacted me about that, I've said, look, if you want to buy a gun, buy it now, then become a patient. Uh, but uh, Confiscation's happening in Hawaii. Yeah. The state of Hawaii is actually going to yeah, the homes because, of people. Yeah, right now, um, you can't. If you honestly answer that question, it actually says now, are you a certified medical state patient? And if you say you're a patient, you, you won't be able to purchase a firearm through legal channels. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a bad situation, and it needs to be straightened out. And I, I for one, believe the Second Amendment is part of the Bill of Rights. You know, I don't, I don't own any guns right now, but I think that we have to respect the Second just like the other parts of the Bill of Rights. And, and uh, so a lot of people are very concerned about that. I mean, yes. Uh, I guess, in a way, tacking onto that, that's sort of contemplating purchasing a new firearm while you're a patient. Existing firearms. You know, if you have a CCW in the state of Missouri, how do you anticipate that might be handled if you're applying for your qualifying patient card, or in the future, if you're like maybe stopped by police and you're a qualifying patient and you've got your CCW? Like, is there any contemplation on how that situation might be addressed? I don't know. Uh, in so far as it's governed by Missouri law, I think the Missouri General Assembly is going to address it. And I know there are many good members of the GOP that want to fix that problem. And there's actually a bill pending um, that says that the state cannot share the names of patients with the federal government, and it's for that reason. But I don't like that approach because it's like saying, well, if you lie on your firearms purchase application, we won't rat you out. Well, you know, that's not a good idea. I'm not going to rely or tell anybody to rely on that. Uh, but, but indeed, as, as far as CCW goes, if I understand correctly, it is regulated by state law. I think that the General Assembly, maybe not this year, but next, I bet you they'll address that question. But again, I, I mean, I don't know gun law real well, but I don't think you're automatically I don't think you're going to be considered a person in possession of illegal drugs if you're legal under state law. I don't think any Missouri police officer, highway patrolman, sheriff's deputy uh, is going to accuse you of a law violation if you're legally in possession of that. For instance, if you're in possession of opioid drugs and you don't have a prescription and you've got a gun, that's a felony to have the gun and it's a felony to have the drug you know, without a prescription. If you've got marijuana and a gun, that's two felonies also, unless you're a patient. But I don't think it's one felony if you're a patient. But that issue hasn't been litigated, uh, and, and I'm sure there are other questions that we may not even have thought of yet that will have to go through the courts of appeals or that will have to be addressed by the, by the General Assembly. Um, there's also a certification for transporting cannabis. Um, they, uh, you know, and I, I kind of regret that we wrote this the way we did, but we, we didn't want DHSS to start considering factors that, that might be inappropriate. So we said that DHSS will score the applicants for licenses on these factors, character, veracity, and you know, a whole lot of other things that you know, would, would make sense, of course. The business plan, uh, how they're going to, I do like the fact we included how they're going to make uh, medical cannabis available to low-income patients. So every person that applies for a license is going to have to say, we're going to serve the needs of low-income patients by giving them a deep discount or giving them free cannabis. Or, but that's one of the factors that we wrote into this that I am proud of. Um, the security, obviously, experience. Not that you have to be someone who worked in another state in illegal cannabis, but you have to have somebody that you're consulting with who has experience working in the legal market in another state. Um, testing facilities experience and obviously in that type of activity and potential for positive impact on the community. And I think, frankly, we're talking about inner city communities there, uh, how they might be helped by the presence of, of uh, these facilities um, and other factors uh, you, can, you can read for yourself, of course. Um, 
maintaining competitiveness competitiveness in the market you know I'm sure they're they're going to be competitive and that's good for patients there should be competition there should be prices should drop to their lowest level um, we also wrote in a 4% tax in addition to the other sales taxes which do apply if not to medicine they'll still apply to medical cannabis um, in addition to the regular sales taxes a 4% tax which will go specifically to aid veterans in Missouri and creating a fund it's administered by the existing Veterans Commission of the state of Missouri and they have been administering programs like that for many years um, the Department of Revenue gets to take out 5% for their activities. We've written this so that it'll fund itself, both from that 4% tax and from the application fees and renewal fees that commercial applicants pay. Um, then after they take their 5%, DOR sends that money to the Veterans Commission. They use it for uh, health and other services for veterans, including uh, operations and maintenance and improvements to Missouri veterans homes, the Missouri Service Officers Program, other services including but not limited to health care, mental health, drug rehab, housing assistance, job training, tuition assistance, and housing to prevent homelessness. So I really think we're going to see a tremendous improvement in veteran services. Yes. I didn't see peace on that. You what? I didn't see peace or anti-war on there. Sorry, what's? Oh, peace, right? I mean, that would prevent a lot of the veteran issues. No, I just, I'm just not hearing. Oh, peace, right? Like anti-war. Oh, anti-war. Yeah, right. Okay. Idea. I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of veterans who work on peace. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. That's a great idea. I hope, I hope it'll be included. <laughs> and of course, the, you know, if you have a card, you're not going to be arrested. This is important. We wrote in because in some states, hospitals were still denying medical patients who were totally legal under state law. Uh, or organ transplants or deprioritizing them for organ transplants so our state constitution now says thou shalt not do that that using marijuana legally is not going to disqualify you for an organ transplant um, but if you have a disqualifying felony offense a violent offense or certain other ones you can't work in this industry um, you know there's forgiveness clauses after so many years um, they have to be owned majority owned by Missouri citizens uh, who've lived here at least one year, but we didn't want out-of-staters to swoop in with their money and just uh, lock up the entire industry. Um, if you're going to grow for yourself or for a patient you're caring for, it has to be in an enclosed, locked facility with certain security devices, and DHSS is proposing more specifics <coughs> about that. Um, you can't sell your license to somebody else unless DHSS approves of it, and this is the one that uh, is being debated right now and tomorrow night. Um, we regret writing in a thousand foot buffer zone around every school daycare center and church because that means there'll be no dispensaries in downtown columbia unless the local government waives it it says unless allowed by the local government i can tell you that kirksville and st louis have eliminated that buffer zone for dispensaries in their downtown area not for cultivation and other stuff but for dispensaries and that at least three other cities i think it's st joe ellisville and creve Coeur, have dropped it back to 300 feet and boonville and at least one other city are now considering doing the same thing but the planning staff here have said they want to keep it a thousand feet they want to be have no dispensaries in downtown columbia i don't think that makes any sense most people and most patients are in downtown columbia so we'll argue about that uh, tomorrow night, <coughs> probably in the coming weeks. Um, government, Why do you local think gov they want it that way? I'm sorry? Why do you think they want it that way? Oh, I've heard that city manager wants that. I, I don't understand why, why it's being proposed. Maybe they'll enlighten us at this hearing tomorrow night. I don't know why they're being proposing such restrictive uh, rules. Um, <coughs> local government can regulate the time, place, and manner of operation. You know, that phrase usually relates to the First Amendment, but <laughs> we threw it in here to, to make it clear that local government has some control, but they can't uh, inflict undue burdens, whatever that might mean, and the courts will decide that if need be. Um, if you sell or possess with intent to sell any illegal drug, you lose your patient card for life. Um, that's under a proposed rule and regulation that could change but that's the proposed rule and that's just the offenses that are included in that um, I'm sure some people are concerned that patients will sell their marijuana to other people but I don't think it calls for a lifetime uh, loss of of your patient card I mean we don't do that to anybody else people who get opiates don't lose their prescription for opiates just because they sold some <coughs> marijuana to somebody and 
you know, it means you, people who commit rape, robbery, murder, child molestation, they can still keep their card, but if you sell marijuana, you can never have a card again. That, that does not strike me as rational. Um, the physician has to certify if it's a, a, a child under 18 that the parent uh, consents to the use of cannabis for whatever conditions being dealt with. Um, the physician has to certify or state that he or she met with the patient uh, and uh, under proposed regs the same day or within five days of the date that that letter is written um, and advise the patient about possible risks and interactions and so forth. Um, the physician under proposed rules has to say uh, that the uh, patient suffers from a uh, condition and uh, that the, again the physician's actually consulted with the patient. Um, dated on an, in an earlier draft on the day the physician met with them, um, physician's license number, but nothing out of line, I think, there. Um, the patient has to be identified clearly. And that's, and that's, that's the end of what I got. Who will be the standard for driving under the influence? Well, it'll be just like it is now. People are arrested and prosecuted right now for driving under the influence of marijuana, and they still will be after this law passes. It's not a get-out-of-jail-free card any more than a prescription will save you from a DWI if you are impaired by Valium or, you know, hundreds of other prescription drugs. You still can be convicted of driving while impaired. Um, your prescription doesn't change that. But with alcohol, it's .08. Yeah. You have a standard. Will there be a standard for marijuana? How do you measure it? It's, it's more being... subjective, but the, the arresting officer will typically say, I observed these symptoms or these uh, uh, behaviors, the glassy eyes, slurred speech, staggering, uh, you know, the, the Waiting roadside, for the stop sign to turn green. Roadside tests, you know, could still be administered, the so-called field sobriety tests. Um, it's always seemed to me what we ought to do for alcohol and any other driving impairment is performance testing that we can administer with a computer, which almost all officers have now. We can administer an eye-hand coordination test or a reaction time test, and no matter what the cause of it is, I mean, we focus now on the cause, and it doesn't really matter what the cause is, it's can you perform sufficiently well to drive a vehicle? So whether it's fatigue, which is a cause of a great many auto accidents, or whether it's schizophrenia or Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia, you know, whatever the cause is, marijuana uh, or pharmaceuticals, you know, really what we want to measure is your ability to, to drive. Uh, and, and so I hope we'll move toward that in the future. Do we have those tests, sir? Okay. Same, and, test, same tests that we would use for alcohol and, and some different ones. And is CPD going through even more intensive training on recognizing that with this being passed now? That, that I don't know. There's, there's specialized training, um, A-RIDE, which is advanced roadside impairment detection, and a, there's a, another training, it's DRE school, that trains officers to identify people that are under the influence of drugs, specifically. How many officers have that training? Is it just Sergeant Sinclair, or is it? No, uh, there were, at one point, there were eight of us. I think there's three that are active now, three or four. Can you describe? DRE can you des training? Yeah, DRE uh -huh. training. Mm -hmm. Can you but I think every officer has some training in. Yeah, standardized field sobriety testing right. everybody gets. Can you describe um, one of those tests for me? As far as what? A reaction one. <clears throat> so what do you mean like a reaction test? that he was just saying that um, there's testing, and that's why I was asking you, does CPD do those reaction tests? Field well, sobriety we, tests? Yeah, we do field sobriety tests, which are actually, they're divided attention to test, tests is what they're classified as. Because I, I just don't want to assume what I see on TV is what you guys are doing. That's why I was asking, can you describe one for me? So some of the divided attention to tests would be like uh, a walk and turn test. So you instruct them to take nine heel-to-toe steps down a line. Uh, you look for certain clues while they're taking, while they're doing that, and then they have to turn around in a specific fashion and then take nine heel-to-toe steps back. Uh, a second test that we would give them would be a one-leg stand test where they have to stand on one foot, they extend their other foot straight and level to the ground, uh, and then they count for an amount of time. And so with marijuana, when I was a DRE, there were certain tests that we looked for 
uh, or certain clues and, and cues that would indicate marijuana use, um, such as fluttering of the eyes and fluttering of the legs. And a simple one is stick your tongue out and there would be green on the back of their tongue. Uh, and then the reddening of the, of the conjunctiva or conjunctiva, however you want to pronounce it. Um, and then rebound dilation, where you would take a pin light, turn the light off, they would get accustomed to the dark. You would take a pin light, put it in towards their, their eyes, and what their pupils would do is they would be normal, and so they'd be dilated in the dark, and what you're looking for is it going back and forth like this. Pulsating light. Essentially, and the term that we use in DRE is rebound dilation. Thank you. How's, um, when you were talking about the marijuana in black and white and how we have that section uh, seven, seven two, like how does that compare nationwide? Is it a more progressive section overall when it comes to past convictions or is it restrictive? How does, how does that compare nationwide? I don't know. That's an interesting question. I just don't know uh, if anyone's researched that. So now that we have medical marijuana, do you see a general opening sooner or later for, med for marijuana becoming legal? Well, that's possible. There are 32 states plus Missouri now that have legalized medical use, and that's since 1996. So um, only 10 of those have, have legalized adult use so far. Uh, Michigan was the first Midwestern state to do it last November. Um, I do think, frankly, that when people have friends and family members who are able to openly consume cannabis and they realize those people don't turn into slobbering idiots and heroin addicts and that marijuana is really not that big a deal, that it's not as dangerous as they've been led to believe, that th there does become a more tolerant attitude. Uh, of you know of non-medical use but not necessary i'll tell you missouri is not there yet if we put legalization on the ballot today it would not pass and uh i have to tell people that every now and then we say why don't we go ahead and put full legalization on the ballot i say because it won't pass and we don't have the money and the energy <laughs> that it takes to put something on the ballot that won't pass the polling that was done last year by various entities showed that there's roughly 46% support for adult legalization, about 20% less than there is for medical. And, um, you know, that's, that turned out to be very accurate. I mean, that's what we got, you know, on election day was 66%. So I think the 46 is probably also accurate. And if public opinion moves in the next few years, then it might make sense to try that. But right now, I, I wouldn't encourage anyone to even try that. And are there any caps on, in the regulations with regard to the taxes, like in Colorado, they had to refund. I'm sure, uh, in regard to taxes? With the amount of taxes collected, I think Colorado had to refund to taxpayers a certain amount of money because they hit a cap. Oh. Well, I'm not familiar with that. Um, but the taxes generally on, on adult use, non-medical use, are certainly a great deal higher. Mm -hmm. That's one reason why there still is a medical program in Colorado. You know, you might wonder, why does anybody even bother uh, getting a doctor's uh, recommendation there? Well, it's because the, it's considerably cheaper if you're a patient. Um, but um, So the two programs work hand in hand? Yeah, there are some facilities that sell both medical and non-medical, and it's essentially the same product, but it's considerably cheaper if you're a medical patient. The, my next question is, in doing the research, if you can think back, and how did it affect the community in a whole. I mean, did was there a, an influx of people moving here now because we um, passed this law? Um, how did it? What was the overall effect on well, on, on there other are, communities? Uh, I know of I know of several people who moved to Colorado because they could not legally use marijuana as medicine here. So we might get people from who knows Iowa, Kansas moving to Missouri, but not not big numbers. I don't think. Um, I don't think it's going to have any of the negative impacts that people fear. Uh, they're not going to, I mean, most of the patients who use cannabis or are going to use cannabis are already using it. Now, there are some, some who aren't. They're especially people my age and older, I guess. Uh, that's where 
surveys have shown the greatest increase in marijuana use where it's been legalized is among geezers. It's among people <laughs> in their 60s, 70s, and 80s um, because they didn't use it before. And that legalizing it, I guess, actually made it easier for them to find and, and, and use. But there's been no increase in use by young people uh, attributable to either medical or even to adult legalization. Um, I, there are, you know, it depends on who you talk to, but you may have seen these billboards all around the state now, this outfit called Weed Maps. I wish they'd put them up before the election, but there are these billboards all over the state now that, you know, each of them has a little factoid on them. And, and I think they're accurate. I, they're truthful and they cite a source. Uh, uh, there's a great deal of research that does show that there's no increase in crime uh, surrounding, even though there is that large amount of cash there, that there's really no increase in crime uh, attributable to to legalization. I mean, there's a lot less crime. If you think so is that it. is that one of the things Pardon? that people are? Is that one of the things that is being said is that there's an increase in crime? Some people say that, or feared that, or predicted that. But you know what we've got right now. And what, with, what are some other ones? I'm sorry. What are some other ones? Uh, property values. People were worried their property values would would go down if they were near a medical facility and the opposite has proven to be true. Um, people are worried about more car accidents attributable, attributable to marijuana, but I don't think that's been proven to be the case anywhere. Um, yes, ma'am. So my former boss used to propose a medical marijuana policy every year in session. And one of her stories was that one of her colleagues, or not necessarily in the house, but one of her friends, um, would have to go and buy marijuana from a drug dealer because she had cancer. Um, and so do you think, you, we're talking about decrease in crime, do you think that it decreases crime because you're no longer funding drug dealers in yes. your communities? And exactly the point I was about to make. Yeah, there's actually less crime, and it's hidden crime, you know, drug dealing is hidden. But there's less illegal drug dealing. I mean, what more could a drug dealer want than prohibition, you know? Prohibition guarantees highly inflated prices. It's a great price support program. And you pay zero taxes. What more could anyone want? You know, prohibition is great for crime, great for criminals. Legalization, not so much. Legalization means you gotta follow the rules, you gotta, you know, have it tested, it's gotta be clean, it's gotta be pure, people know what they're getting, um, and, and you gotta pay taxes, you know? it's uh, uh, you know, in some places, in, in California, they got too greedy. In California put the tax on marijuana so high that a lot of people are still buying from the black market. And that's because it's cheaper. You know, you can't get too greedy. There is a point where if you put the tax so high, people are just going to say, well, I'm, I'm not going to pay that. You know, I'm going back to the guy on the corner. <laughs> and uh, uh, so it's not a, it's certainly not an unlimited amount of tax that you can put on it, but you can put a pretty healthy sin tax on marijuana just like we do on alcohol you know if we put the tax on alcohol too high then the the stills out in the woods will reappear but you know <laughs> that's not happening uh, and we do allow of course we do allow people to brew their own beer make their own wine even distill their own uh, spirits if they want to but almost nobody does that not on any large scale and that's what we see where marijuana is available is that, is that you know even those patients who can grow for themselves probably you know, a certain percent will try and say, this is hard, you know, <laughs> this is not, it's not easy, it's expensive, you got to buy all this stuff to do it with, um, and most landlords don't want you growing marijuana plants in their apartments, so, you know, I think the vast majority of people will buy from dispensaries, and that's why we think it's so important to have true competition, to keep the prices competitive. So what happens with the people who apply and don't get licenses, I, from my understanding is, their application fees are just, they're lost. They're forfeited. What we have urged, and I'm glad you reminded me because I want to write to DHSS again about this. What we have urged them to do is to say to those people who don't get a license, when or if we expand the licensing, your fee will still be on file and not make them pay a second time. Um, you know, at least give them a little consolation because you're right, they're paying six, ten thousand dollars and they don't get a license, they don't get that fee back. Right. Um, it's we hope to me, it seems like an expensive lottery ticket. It is. It is. That's exactly right. But we hope that they'll allow them to apply again without paying a second fee in a year or so down the road. What are your biggest concerns with legalized medical marijuana? 
Um, um, I should be able to think of some joke, but I, I can't. I, you know, I mean, I can't think of any real concerns. Uh, I, I just don't think there's been any negative impact where it's been tried. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's worked well. Uh, it has not resulted in an increase in use. That's the single mm -hmm. most important fact. Uh, Colorado, and I don't think there's any evidence to the contrary elsewhere, Colorado published a study a couple years ago, and they are required by state law to do, an, I think, an annual report. And it's kind of buried in there. I, I, you know, I would think it should be big headlines, but what they conclude is there has been no increase in use since legalization in Colorado. Now, there's a lot of people from Missouri and Kansas and Nebraska going there and buying marijuana and smoking it, but as far as the people of Colorado, the state says there's been no increase in either the number of people who use it or in the frequency of use by those who do use it. And to me, that's the single most important fact, because no matter what you think is bad about marijuana, if there's no more people using it, then whatever is bad is not getting any worse. But we're not ruining people's lives. We're not turning good people into criminals. We're not treating otherwise law-abiding people as if they're horrible criminals. And that's, that's what bothers me the most. I represent people and have for 33 years, you know, all over Missouri for marijuana crimes. And, uh, they're nice people, you know. I'm, I'm lucky to be able to represent them, but they don't deserve to be treated like criminals. Any concerns over the way the law is going to be implemented? Yes, this thousand-foot buffer zone in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, but oh, a few others. But really, for the most part, I am really happy with what the DHSS is doing. They have been, I think, they've just done as good a job as anybody could ask, and that's not true in many other states. In many states. Uh, like Louisiana passed the law in 2015 and they still don't have a program and Arkansas in 2016 and they've just barely gotten it off the ground. These guys are doing a good job. I mean, we wrote the deadlines into the law too, but <laughs> that know, helps a little them. bit. Yeah, well, you know, and one of the things that, that helped them, I mean, it's totally reasonable response to say, hey, you can pass whatever you want, but it's not in our budget. We don't have the money to hire people to do all this stuff. That's why, and again, we weren't that smart. We just had the advantage of seeing what happened in other states. And so we said, you can pay your application <coughs> fee in January, but you can't actually apply for a license until August. So that gave DHSS seven months with millions of dollars to spend that, that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And so that worked out real well. I mean, we, we are lucky that we have the advantage of being able to see what's happened in 32 other states and, and take advantage of their, ex not their mistakes, but their experience. <laughs> and uh, uh, so we have. I'm, I'm very encouraged about the way the whole program's going. I have a question for you, Sergeant, because um, I just don't want to assume. I think I know the answer, but I just, like I said, I just want to assume. When, Mike, because I just don't mm -hmm. hear very well. When, when you do, when they're doing their traffic stops, what is the number one drug that they find? I'm sorry, the number one what? I'm, I'm talking, oh, asking sorry. the sergeant, yes. I, I don't know. I don't know that we even keep stats like that or how we would run a report like that. So, okay. I think we should probably do that so that in the end we can figure out to answer questions like this, you know, is, is, is there an increase, is there a decrease, is, has things changed, you know, because I think it is important to know, you know, when, when a person is arrested, you know, especially in a traffic stop, what paraphernalia that they had, if they had drugs, all of that, somebody should be keeping track of that. Well, I mean, we, in the, in the offense report, it shows what was taken, but I don't, know that we have a reporting mechanism to say, you know, I'm just throwing numbers. For, out of 400 traffic stops, 100 were for marijuana, 100 were for methamphetamine, 100 were for heroin. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't know if there's a way to do that. We would have to go through every traffic stop arrest and document it that way, so not sure. Is there anything else? Mr. Veets, we really appreciate you coming in and taking the time to talk to us. Uh, everything you covered today ran a little long, and we definitely appreciate it. Thank you very and much. And you are welcome back at any time. Thank you very much. I'll take you up on that. Thank you. Have a nice day. And